one of the things that we in Dallas, I, I think from you know an analyst and a fan perspective, one of the things that gets talked about a lot with this Cowboys team is they're they're very finesse and they've been very finesse for a couple years now offensively and defensively like pin your ears back and rush and play super fast and attack and on offense let's you know push the ball down the field and and do things like that and we all kind of feel like they just lack that toughness and that physicality that that seems necessary to to win in january and win in february as somebody who came from pittsburgh and, and played in a very physical system is there a lack of respect for those types of teams? Do you look at them and say, like, they, they can't compete come January? They, they don't have that physicality. They don't have that toughness. And that is that is a necessary component if you want to win a championship. Well, I will tell you, you know, listen, I've, I've worked for a, with a lot of great coaches. Jimmy Johnson would be one of them. Did, we worked together one year during the draft. Um, Marty Schottenheimer, um, 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 Bill Parcells, um, John Gruden, and then I played for Chuck Knoll and Bill Cower. So I've played for and worked with some of the greatest minds in the history of our game. If you pin them down to what is one of the most critical components to winning successfully in the National Football League, and it still exists today, is that you have to control the tempo of a game. How do you control the tempo of a game? Two ways. You stop somebody's ability to run the football. Now that neutralizes one phase of their offense, and now it makes it easier to defend. Mm-hmm. And then if we can establish a running attack, rather that is a power attack, which I would favor, okay, why are the Ravens always in it? Even though, you know, Lamar got it, they forced him to play quarterback in that game, and he struggled with that. But up to that point, nobody could control the tempo when you played the Ravens. Yeah. They controlled the tempo until Kansas City controlled the tempo. One of the best ways now, if you just, if you to or have that discussion with all those people I just talked about, I think most of them would lead to a power type running attack to control the tempo of the game. That would be their favor in their running in their running game. Um, having a perimeter type of running game is doesn't mean you can't have a, a physical presence because Ron uh, Ron Earhart, um, one of our offensive coordinators who won the Super Bowl when they beat the Buffalo Bills, who's offensive coordinator for Bill Parcells, was our offensive coordinator when he came to Pittsburgh. And we, our predominant running game was the perimeter running game, but it was a power style of perimeter running. So what I'm getting at is if you had to select a power running attack is the best. Is what I was, if I was going to establish an offense, that is exactly that is the first thing that I would put in. I'd put them, here is what we are going to do every Sunday. And people that do that, I played with coordinators, I played with them. Um, Ron Earhart, Tom Moore. Tom Moore was my first offensive coordinator who orchestrated all of Peyton Manning's career. Um, even in Peyton Manning's career, they had a running game, but they have a unique quarterback that they could do some different things with. Like I used to, we used to joke all the time, I go, why don't we run an offense like that when we played? You know, we didn't have Peyton Manning. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Hmm. And that's what good coordinators do. You go to what you do well. Now, I, th- I think what the Cowboys did do, you know, you, you did create a little more efficiency from your quarterback position, you know. And I keep in mind that's new learning for him, and I expect him to be a lot better this year than he was last year. To add a a, a power type phase to their running attack, I I would not I, listen. That wouldn't bother me at all if I was the Dallas Cowboys because I think that would give me a lot better chance to play the teams like you're going to play in Washington, New York, and Philly. Merrill so. Hodge here on 105.3 The Fan with all this talk about the run. I'm going to venture to guess that you're not the biggest analytics guy. You're all right. There's one. There's, there's one. Only. Oh, there's actually one stat. And actually, this is true. Did you know I, that before you booked him, RJ? I know you wouldn't have booked him if, if he didn't love. I don't, I don't have a. I don't. I don't. I'm not anti anti analytics. I'm not anti the anti analytics people. Yes, except you are. for Michael Lombardi. Yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> here, here's the, here. This is true. That there's only one statistic, only one that matters. And you can't get it until the end of the game, but only it is the greatest statistic for indicating wins and losses in the National Football League, and that is turnovers. There's nothing else that trumps that statistic, none. But you don't get it till after the game. So, you know how how much they pull the guard, you know how much the tackle, pull. I mean, all of that stuff is. Uh, listen, I don't get. Well, here's what I use analytics for to support what I see on tape. Tape leads sure. me to everything. Yeah. Tape tells me everything. 
And, you know, I, I could tell you how many runs they go to the strong side versus the weak side, how many times the guards, how, are they a, a pin and pull team, mm -hmm. you know, are they a zone reading team, are they a man blocking team, are they a zone blocking I don't need a statistic. Statistics don't tell me how good they are at it anyway. You know, they don't, like, you know, people use um, um, completion percentage for accuracy. That doesn't tell you anything. It tells you they completed the ball, period. Right. You know, and, and when I see these um, tight windows, what's a tight window? You know, I mean, what's that? Mm -hmm. Explain a tight window to me. And if somebody's is wide open and that's a completion, to me, did he run after the catch? All these other things come into play that a statistic can't tell you. How is his pocket presence? Give me a statistic that tells me about pocket presence, how, he's feel, how he feels, how he moves, slides, you know, manages the pocket. There's no statistic that can tell you that. Tell me the statistic that's going to give me is the guy tough. Yeah. Okay, tell me the statistic that tells me the guy plays smart. I don't want to test at the stupid combine. That's, just, that's the dumbest <laughs> thing. If anybody wants to destroy that, just to take the C.J. Stroud garbage that you did. Yeah. And whatever team said, oh, he's not a smart player. Okay, he didn't play dumb. I, didn't ever watch, I never watched him on one game go, man, I question that guy's ability to process stuff. One of the, most, the smartest people I saw playing football. I don't care he did, he did bad on a test. So he's not good on tests. Irrelevant to football. So right. I just, that's just how I look at, at statistics. I don't think they're – I don't ignore them, but I don't. They, they do not drive me to my evaluation of a team or an, indi an individual player. Merrill, give us your X's and O's kind of story on some of our defensive coordinator names to replace Dan Quinn: Mike Zimmer, Rex Ryan, <laughs> Wink Martindale. Yeah. Well, listen. I mean, all three are unique and different. Now, as soon as I hear Rex Ryan. I think of his dad because I played against his dad yeah. when he was with Houston Oilers. And I, he did some of the most bizarre, crazy things. We actually in practice on a Thursday. And this one, I think they had about five first-round draft picks for the Houston Oilers, and they were all on the defensive lineman. And they would play all five of them. Wow. And what they would do is they would line them up. They wouldn't go five head up. Sometimes they would do. But sometimes they'd start at one guard and, wide, and they'd have two guys outside the tackle. Okay, so we actually in practice, um, and since I was our third down back too, um, we would literally talk about it like this. Go, our coach, my coach would talk to us, me about. I I just can't tell you exactly what they're gonna do. You just got to adjust to it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's how we would go into his game plan. He would do some things that would be like unsound, but they would do it in such a reckless fashion, and they would do it in a way that you'd miss the guy that they didn't account mm -hmm. for. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> In our second time, that's why in, within the division, we started to figure him out, and we had some answers for the mysteries. Right. Um, but that's when I kind of I think about Rex Ryan. There's some there's a, a some wildness to it. And some some he's I, he's a lot like his dad. Yeah. Okay. So he has that. Now, that now they're gonna come after you though. You know, you better be prepared. I mean, it is not gonna be. Oh, after the fifty, they're gonna come at you. You never know when they're gonna come at, and you don't know what they're coming at you with. Um, who did you have in there? Mike Zimmer. Okay, Zimmer. Mike Zimmer. I mean, I've, I've always loved Mike Zimmer from, you know, he's an A-gap pressure guy, and he does so many things off of that. And I think he is one of the best in, in football period for 20, 30 years of doing that. I think he does a great job. I and mean, that's a stressful thing, and you challenge your players. they got to be really buttoned up and to be sound to adjust. You, you, they, we all see it the same way. Because if you're the guard and it's in the A-gap, I know you're going to take that and then I'm going to reach the other guy on the outside or whatever the, the, mm -hmm. the rule is. I can't have you and me blocking the same guy, which that's what he does. He challenges that. that everybody's going to see it the same way. All we need is one guy to see it wrong, and he challenges that. So I love that aspect of him. And the third guy was Wink. 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 Well, Wink has always been, you know, all these guys demonstrate pressure. You know, Wink has been, um, he, he's going to create all kinds of, devices and phases and ways to look. What's the best one? Well, what's his name? Zimmer's been there before. 13 you know, years, I yeah, think. Zim, was it 13 he, I think or he went, 7? <laughs> I think he went was, from there to Cincinnati, didn't he? He did, Cincinnati, right? He, then, he was the coordinator for seven years here. He coached here for 13. Yeah, so they have a good feel for him. Um, you know, I don't, then the people that you have, I don't know, I don't think Zimmer might be a, a – from my perspective, a better fit for what Dallas needs. So, so do you you would hire based on the personnel you have, as opposed to just hiring the coach that you think? Well, I, you know, each one of those guys. Um, that's why I like Zim because I think Zim 
might be the best to adjust. See, here's what makes a great, really good coach. Okay, you have a philosophy. I, I do A, but I come in and I look and I'm like, oh, you got B and C. But I'm going to adjust to B and C, and we're going to create a blend here. And I'm not going to say, oh, you do this because this is my system and it's one. You look at, and I think Zim, I think all the guys do that fairly well. I know Zim a little more in depth with how he will take his philosophy and adjust it to your personnel. Merrill Hodge sitting down with us here, former NFL player, analyst we grew up on on the home of the Cowboys. How shocked are you that Belichick is not coaching? I am not. Um, and I don't think that what we don't know about the Belichick is the, the times that he was just like, you know what, it just doesn't, it doesn't, that fit, that doesn't fit me. I don't have enough time. Now, listen, if you're going to look at the any – here's where the, I think a lot of organizations make mistakes is you come in and you're – you're already re, you're rebooting every two years. Do you know how hard it is? I don't care what business you're running. Mm. Every time you're rebooting two or three years later, you cannot be successful because you you're rebooting all the time. Yeah. Right. And I, I just think that both sides have to look at, is the, can he run a, a good five, ten year window for me? And uh, you got to be, you got to think strongly about that. And that's probably a no. Um, does he have a quarterback that he thinks that he can? The answer work to that's right probably a no. Because of his age? I did because of his age. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just think that you, you, you have to consider that. It's like, boy, can I – does he got does he got 10 in him? Yeah. You know, because I'd like to – I'd like you, to give him the time to build, and yeah. that's what it's going to take. Do you agree with the stylistic concerns of too rough and gruff for today's NFL, the personnel drafting concerns that are out there of him? Well, like, you know, when I think – what I think Bill Parcells has done a pretty good job of overall, um, where a lot of teams don't, is Bill Parcells – I mean, Bill Belichick, sorry. Even Bill Parcells would do this, but Bill Belichick is when they make a mistake – this is the, this is one of the biggest mistakes that all organizations mm -hmm. make. Let's say you draft a first-rounder. You know your second year, we made a mistake. Yep. Okay, you don't say we made a mistake and get rid of him. You're like, ah, let's hang on to him one more year. And then, you know, then you're in your yeah. fourth year, and I'm like, why did I do that? Because what are you telling your team? Okay, I want the best of you. You give me the best, and I'm not going to give the best back to you. I'm not going to put the best player out there. I'm doing. I'm using a guy that's right. killing us. I, and almost every team team does that. I would say Bill Belichick, for the most part, was probably one of the best. After two years, get rid of him. Do you, have you dinged? If he wasn't the guy. Have you dinged him as a uh, his legacy post Brady? Like like oh, it's all Tom. No, uh, listen, I I says I know the value of coaching. And I know, the, you know, the value of good players, too. And that was a great mix for a long time. And I'm not going to upgrade one or downgrade the other. Bill Belichick, and listen, this comes from a guy who played for Chuck Knoll, one of the greatest, a Mount Rushmore in the National Football League, that, you know, would hard for me to say there was somebody better. The reason I would say Bill Belichick was better than Chuck Knoll, Chuck Knoll resigned because he did not want to, play the environment of free agency like i asked him we're the last game at three rivers we we're standing there the washington redskins came in to play last game and i said you miss it and he turned to me and he said i'm not a recruiter and that hit it mm. i was like he wasn't going to play the free agency role he wasn't going to go out he wanted to build via the draft okay the only reason i share that bill belichick has won super bowls and won in both those environments i can't even tell you how hard and it, if you, did, if you backed up and said, can anybody do that? I'm like, no. Because why, the environment and the adjusting that has to take place, and he did it. And I just – and the way he's done it is, I think, is extraordinary, and nobody's ever done that in the history of our game. I may never do it uh, ever right. again just because of his longevity. What do you think of McCarthy? You know, I've always liked him. Liked him when he was in Green Bay. Um, now, I don't know how he is, you know, I, I like his overall, how he runs offense, how, how he's run a team. Listen, he's taking a team to a Super Bowl. So, it isn't like he hasn't won there. Um, I don't know what he is truly like, you know, in the rough times. I, I don't know that. You know, he seems like he's he's stable, though. And the, what I know of him, and, I, and I, I've met him several times and I've talked to him, I think he has – Structure and stability, which you need not when it's good, when it's when it's bad. Mm -hmm. Merrill Hodge here in the A number one air hot seat. Talk to us about what you're doing with PN Medical. Well, it's actually breather fit. Now, <laughs> did you know at age, once you get to age 30, your um, respiratory system starts to decline if you don't do any cardio? Okay, now 
this would mean nothing to me because I've been doing cardio, I've been training my whole life, but I had open heart surgery. Before I could leave the hospital, I had to strengthen my respiratory system, I had to strengthen my lungs. So I'm like, oh, wait a minute, they had my attention. I'm like, what do you mean? I didn't realize your respiratory system and your heart are separate. They just work together. Mm-hmm. I didn't know you could train your respiratory system in a way to help you breathe better. So think of you, don't do any cardio. By age 30, you start to slowly decline. So that means less oxygen going through your brain efficiently every day. Well, oxygen is a vital component to overall health. We may not think it like right. that. And the ability to breathe, and the easier that you breathe, the healthier you will be. So I was like, well, I don't, I've done open heart surgery. I've experienced it getting out of a hospital. I'm like, I'm going to put it to the test. And so I actually, this happened on accident. I go on a trip where all I did was lift and stretch. I didn't really do much cardio. I come back 10 days later, and I start my cardio back up. And I'm like, but I kept the breather with me. So I did it twice a day. For, it takes about five minutes. You can do it anywhere, sitting. Um, it's not complicated. You don't got to have a gym. You've got to drive. But I stayed working on that. And so when I went to start working, I could tell looking at my heart that it had been off for two weeks. You know, my heart rate was getting a little higher yeah. quicker than it normally would. But my ability to breathe was easier. And I was like, holy cow. <laughs> There's so much. I mean, there, so you wouldn't think much of it that your respiratory system can be trained. So let's say you're not doing anything cardiovascular-wise, anything physical-wise. It would be a great way to start just to improve your overall breathing yeah. ability and capacity. And then hopefully that would spark you to maybe do a little more to invest in your health. And and here's the, the worst-case scenario you get. You get a healthier, happier life out of it. So it's like this uh, it was a win-win, and I just uh, I'd never I'd never thought of it. I had I'd, I'd love to learn about health and fitness and how can we improve our health and fitness. And it's a great way to start it out, and it's a few minutes a day. And the value in strengthening your respiratory system um, makes life better for you. So I encourage you. You'll, you'll, you'll actually go to breatherfit.com. That will help you with um, what we're talking about and look into it and see if it's something you might want to try. Merrill, thank you so much for yeah, sitting thank down you with guys. us again another year. Always appreciate it. Always, Always enjoy appreciate it. Dallas. Are you guys uh, bow hunters at all? Do no. Talk to, oh, okay. no. <laughs> you kind of look like bow hunters. So I was oh, like, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you the, look, that's you look, you look a little like bow, some bow hunters. I'm like, man, we got, I got to get up, back up to Texas and that, do me a little bow hunting. That's, some white man, tail. that's the manliest compliment we've ever received. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> I could do it. Merrill, I'm glad I could do it. Merrill Hodge <laughs> here on 105.3 The Thank fans. you, boys.